District 1, Barbara McQuinn. Here. District 2, Alexandria Ayala. Here. District 3, Karen Brill. Here. District 4, Erica Whitfield. Here. District 5, Frank Barbieri. Here. District 6, Marsha Andrews. Here. District 7, Deborah Robinson. Here. We have quorum with all seven board members in attendance. Also joining us is Superintendent Michael Burke, General Counsel Sean Bernard, Inspector General Teresa Michael, and Board Clerk Tony Bellata. Senior staff members will join us periodically as directed by the superintendent. Viewers and listeners can access the meeting today by either watching on Comcast channels 234 and 235, UVerse channel 99, or by using the YouTube link on our webpage at palmbeachschools.org. In the event that the link is interrupted for technical reasons, please switch over to the TV channels. All board meetings are recorded in their entirety and posted on the district website within 24 hours. We also offer a listening-only option which the public can access by calling 561-357-5900 or toll-free at 1-866-930-7015. The meeting ID is 1-561-880-1124, pound sign. On behalf of the board, I'd like to welcome any public speakers who are joining us today. The school board supports the peaceful assembly of persons to express themselves regarding matters concerning district students, employees, and the community. Please adhere to the safety protocols that were provided to you upon entry and which outline in more detail what is expected. As a reminder, public comments must relate to the subject matter of the agenda item for which the speaker had requested to address. Pursuant to school board policy, speakers whose comments do not relate to the topic that the speaker indicated, including but not limited to the mention of any person's candidacy for elected office are subject to having the microphone turned off and forfeiting the right to speak at the remainder of today's meeting. Again, your attendance here at the board meeting is appreciated. Thank you for helping us to maintain the orderly conduct of school board meetings. Board members, we have nine uh, sets of minutes to approve. We have a motion. Motion by Mrs. Andrews. Okay. Second by Ms. Ayala. All in favor? Opposed? Motion carries 7-0. Would everyone please stand for the pledge to be led by... General Counsel Sean Bernard. Pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America, and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. There's been one item added to the agenda for good cause, P2, a personnel addendum. Good cause exists for adding this item so the employees can begin in their new positions as soon as possible. Mr. Superintendent, do you have items you're withdrawing? Yes, sir, I do. Uh, with TL1 and BRD1. All right. Um, and board, we have one item that's been pulled by board members, uh, SP1. Are there any other ones you want to pull at this time? Seeing none, we need a motion to approve the agenda as modified. Motion by Mrs. Andrews, seconded by Mrs. Whitfield. Any discussion? All in favor? Opposed? Motion carries 7-0. Are there any disclosures or abstentions? Seeing none, Mr. Superintendent, comments? Yes, sir. Uh, again, I'd like to thank the board for the workshop earlier today. We had a, a for the public, we had a, a nice discussion, and we're working on a, a strategic plan for the district that will guide us for the next five years. We've, we've got some more work to do. Uh, but that workshop was incredibly beneficial. Uh, we also had a couple workshops on March 2nd where we dug into our instructional review uh, and also our, some of our mental health initiatives for our students. Uh, tonight's meeting is our you know, regular monthly meeting. This is where we conduct the business of the board. We have a, a wide array of agenda items and, and of course that's, they're, they're out there on the agenda now. Uh, my announcements tonight, you know, in the spirit of March Madness, uh, I hope everyone's doing okay with their bracket. I, I am not, and uh, my Florida State Seminoles did not make it this year to the dance. But we are very fortunate here in Palm Beach County because we've got our own talented team. Uh, we had Lake Worth High School that advanced to the state's Final Four and just had an outstanding season. Yeah, let's hear it. So now, go Trojans. But they had a great year. Uh, we got a, stri a short video that kind of highlights their season here, so we'd like to play that for the audience. Hi, my name is Frank Baxter. I'm the head basketball coach and athletic director here at Lake Worth Community High School. 
Really proud of our guys in the year that we've had. We went 21 and four, finished 7A Region 3 champions. And we also made it all the way to the final four for the state finals. And I'm just so proud of our guys and our accomplishments. They've done everything that was asked of them um, from day one. We wanted to dedicate this season, Dr. Ellis, because uh, he's a special guy. Um, he's a tremendous leader. Knowing that he's about to retire, uh, we want to do something special for him in the way we do it by winning on and off the court that's in the classroom and also uh, in the field of play. I'm honored. I'm honored. I try to attend as many games as possible. Win or lose, they were supporting one another, and that's what I want. That's the impact I want. One of our leaders on the court this year was our point guard, Calvin Sermons. Everybody was uh, accounted for and doing the right thing. Uh, on the court and off the court. We have 13 of the 14 guys returning next year. We even look for more success, even a state championship here at Lake Worth High School. All right, so I'd like to invite our principal at Lake Worth High, Dr. Elvis Epps, and Coach Baxley, and uh, any members of the team that were able to make it out tonight. If the board would join me uh, down on the floor, we'd like to uh, take a group picture. Well, that, that was awesome. Congratulations again, and we look forward to next season. Uh, one more special presentation tonight. Uh, one of our longtime uh, local heroes here, Mr. Mark Murray, is uh, wrapping up 33 years of service. We all know Mr. Murray well. He is our uh, audio-video uh, expert back here who makes sure all these board meetings are captured, you know, recorded, broadcast live, and maintained on YouTube for... Uh, decades to come, if not centuries to come. So we want to thank Mr. Murray, congratulate him on his retirement. Uh, Mr. Murray is also a great DJ, and he's helped me out over the years. So. Thank you, Dr. Sheffield. And you know, I forgot to mention, Mr. Murray is a proud alum of Lake Worth High School. 
So uh, Lake Worth High swept the presentations tonight. All right. <laughs> All right. So let's see. Those were my big announcements. Uh, Mr. Chair, I can uh, turn it back over to the board. All right. Board comments. Mrs. McQuinn. Just one. I wasn't going to have any, but following up, I do want to um, also thank Ms. Greenway. I didn't do that for the um, excellent way that she has managed to, I won't say corral us, but to frame our work. I'm very excited about it. We all know I like strategic plan. I do, I'd like to make a suggestion in terms of the discussion we had earlier about involving more schools. My hope is that the board and the superintendent guide the district so we have our strategic plan. And I'm so excited that schools will have it come spring in order to do their, their um, school improvement plans for next year. That's where I think we have the opportunity for their students to take what we cull from the other schools that are going to be visited and bring that to their students. So every school can build upon what, it's like Dr. Robinson said, some schools, some student may not even know what to imagine. Well, they'll see what other students imagined and be able to use that. So my hope is that each school will include students in that way in the development of their way of moving forward. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Ayala. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I have quite a few today, a lot of great things going on. First, I'd like to recognize and congratulate Paul Steberer, a social studies teacher from Okihili Middle School. He was just selected as the South Region Beginning Teacher of the Year, so I wanted to congratulate him and the entire school community at Okihili Middle for their continued excellence. Next, I wanted to uh, give support and congrats to the Meadow Park Elementary School students who finally got to perform The Lion King after being on hold for two years due to COVID, and they performed to four sold-out crowds. So I want to thank the school, the teachers, the students for their dedication, as well as the community for coming around and coming out to show support for the students and their artistic endeavors. It is so important. Uh, next, Hope Centennial Elementary was featured on Channel 12 talking about how they've been meeting student needs post-COVID after the pandemic has really impacted their mental health. And I know that Principal Nathan and her team have been working really hard to do that and be there for students. So I wanted to give them a kudos for being recognized as a leader in that space. Next, I wanted to congratulate uh, someone who I have so much respect for one of our own, uh, Patricia Trejo, an administrative program planner for Hispanic and Latino studies in the district for being recognized as a Hispanic Women of Distinction for 2022. Um, I was also selected as an honoree, which is a huge honor, and I look forward to celebrating together with her in August at the ceremony. And last, but certainly not least, as a former band student myself, as excited as I was about the Lake Worth Trojans sports wins, uh, I want to congratulate the district band programs that receive superiors, which is the highest possible rating, at the district concert and state jazz music performance assessments, or MPAs as they're known. I remember learning to play the flute at Palm Springs Middle School and being very nervous to go to my first solo and ensemble performance assessment. <laughs> so these, many of these students learned to play virtually, practiced at home on their own through a computer screen, and I want to just congratulate them for overcoming their hurdles. To give you a quick picture, 27 schools, including eight Title I schools and three within District Two, Coniston Middle, Forest Hill High, and Palm Springs Middle, my alma mater, achieved a rating of superior. So, and to give you an idea, two of these programs have band directors that have been there less than a year or three years. <laughs> so they have been working through the pandemic and I really just want to um, congratulate you on persevering and committing to excellence in performance. I support you. Keep up the great work. Thank you. Thank you. Mrs. Whitfield. 
Thank you so much. I'm over here cheering as Miss Isle is speaking because my daughter was in that superior group at Coniston. Very, very proud mom over here of a trumpet player. Um, so I want to talk um, really briefly um, about an exciting thing that happened um, recently at Lake Worth High. I'm so thrilled. Um, we recently had Guy Frieri from Diners, Drive-Ins, and Dives. That one, I'm not totally sure I got that right. Um, anyway, he um, came yesterday to Lake Worth High School and um, actually was uh, gave... Uh, $20,000 to the culinary program over there. And I'm ridiculously proud because he recently bought a house in my uh, neighborhood. And so he is now at Lake Worth Beach, a uh, partial resident. He has uh, houses all over the place, but he has one uh, right in downtown. And uh, again, this is what I love from... Um, our community is when they give back and they commit to um, being a part of their schools and just he's a great example um, that he showed up and immediately said, uh, where do I need to support in my community? So huge thank you to Guy Fieri um, for coming and, and recognizing our students. I know he gave an amazing day to those kids yesterday uh, that they got to see someone so famous and that they, he's actually contributing uh, to, their, to their schooling. Um, uh, one other thing I just want to say, um, I am having a very hard time with what happened in Royal Palm Beach um, with the students that were hit and um, and are not doing well, um, from my understanding. And I just, having a child who's the same age as them, uh, my heart absolutely goes out to those families, and I just wanted to... Uh, say quickly um, to the families and everyone at Royal Palm High School who's been affected by this, um, you know, my heart is with you, um, and I just, um, absolute thoughts and prayers for what's going on uh, with those families. It's hard for us at the school district when we hear um, children have been hurt uh, in our schools, and specifically this story has really gotten to me, so I just wanted to take a minute and just say um, how sorry I am uh, for what's going on, and I'm uh, hoping that, you know, we have some some good news um, at all is in the future. Thank you. Thank you, Mrs. Andrews. Thank you, and Mr. Barbieri, uh, through, uh, for the superintendent, I'd like to have a few minutes uh, to speak about my family, uh, Royal Palm Beach High School. I have a few words to say, and then I'd like to ask for a couple of minutes of silence. First, I'd like to say our hearts go out to the families of the four Royal Palm Beach High School students who were the victims of the automobile accident on yesterday morning while they waited for the school bus. Uh, a terrible tragedy that happened to our students. They were doing the right thing, coming to school, doing what they should be doing, getting ready to get their education. I wanna to say to the families, our hearts and our prayers go out to you, all of you. These moments that we'll take in a few minutes also go out to the students who were at the bus stop. The trauma that they receive seeing their friends their classmates hit by this car. Those who ride the bus, the bus that goes by that stop, have been traumatized too. The entire Royal Palm Beach High School family, we pray. We pray for you each and every day, all the students at the school, the teachers, the staff, everybody in the Royal Palm Beach family, the community, Royal Palm Beach community, you're an awesome community. I live in Royal Palm Beach. We are all together, banding together for you as we pray for our students. We have grief counselors at the school, therapy dogs. We will give our students the time to take the time to talk about their feelings as we go through this process. It's a process where we have children in the hospital fighting for their lives trying to make it. We know that there's a higher power that takes charge of everything, and our prayers go out to everyone. So these moments are solid moments for the children who were impacted on yesterday in any way. Those that are in the hospital, all of the students at the school, the families, the community, these moments are for you, and we will continue to have these moments for you as we get through this crisis. May we bow our heads for a few minutes, please. Thank you. 
Thank you. As I do my remarks today, it's with a heavy heart, but I'm going to try to get through them. I want to congratulate uh, Loxahatchee Groves Elementary School principal, Mr. Richard Myerson, for his leadership in establishing an education advisory board for his school in partnership with Palm Beach State College, the Loxahatchee Groves campus. Your work with the college on STEAM programs for your students is moving forward. It was exciting to see your teachers and staff over at the college on Monday for the Professional Development Day, learning about all of the aspects of STEAM programs. Uh, they had firsthand experiences. Congratulations to the region uh, staff, uh, Valerie Haynes, Vivian Green, uh, all of the people from Palm Beach State, uh, Mary McNicholas, all of the people who are working together to make Loxahatchee Groves Elementary School a great school, starting out with the principal. And Pahokee High School, you're always doing great things. The Federal Reserve Vice Chairman was at your school on yesterday celebrating your debate team. It was the first annual high school debate summit. Forty students from across the state made it to Pahokee to celebrate Pahokee's debate team and to listen to inspiring words from the federal vice chair of the Federal Reserve. Mr. the Denard, Principal Denard, the team over at Pahokee, go, go, you're getting it done. And lastly, it's my uh, pleasure to say I had the honor to be in Washington, D.C., representing this school board at the Council of Great City Schools on the Policy and Legislative Conference. I uh, will have information for you uh, working through the superintendent. We learned a great deal. We were able to advocate on legislative policies and it was a wonderful experience. I have wonderful news for you as it relates to policies, procedures, legislative events uh, from the federal level as we move forward, uh, as we move out of this pandemic. Lots of good things are happening from the federal level. Thank you. Thank you, Mrs. Andrews. Dr. Robinson. Thank you. Um, well, we had a, a really awesome event last night um, at Roosevelt Middle School to talk about the plans for historic Roosevelt. And I really cannot at this point in time express my joy um, following the acknowledgement of recent tragedies. So I would just ask that you um, look at that that program on the school district's YouTube channel. Um, and I just want to especially thank the staff of 10 and most especially Trish, who saved the day um, by having people text her personal phone to ask questions when the YouTube went down temporarily. So thank you, but, but please um, watch the video and share my joy. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Robinson. Vice Chair Brill. Thank you. So I just also want to again reiterate um, our thoughts and prayers, our hearts are with the Royal Palm Beach family, the families, the students, the community. Um, it's hard to be upbeat after shifting gears, um, and but I'm going to share my comments. So to want to begin that I hope everyone had a good spring break. I don't know if it's me, but it already feels so long ago now that we're back. Um, I want to first give a hearty congratulations to the fabulous one and only high school in my district, Park Vista Community High School's women's choir known as Prima, opened for Foreigner on March 10th at the Pompano Beach Amphitheater. So rock on Prima, we're very proud of you. I had the opportunity to meet with the Norton Museum Learning and Community Engagement Committee and I'm so, so very excited about the opportunities the museum will be providing to the community. And I know you will all be hearing more about that in the near future. I was delighted to join Mr. Burke and Ms. Ayala at the Fiesta de Pueblo and Business Expo in Green Acres. And I was also able to join Mr. Burke at Insight's annual luncheon where they, not, they honored Maureen Carter, our former K-12 Holocaust Education Program Planner. I could go on and on with additional activities, but I want to take a moment to recognize Jenna Brule, the recipient of the Thank a Teacher Award at Carl Reef Elementary School earlier this month. Please start the video if you do have it. We have a video to share. 
Hi, I'm Jenna Briette and I teach fifth grade here at Coral Reef Elementary. I wear different Mickey ears every day. I try not to have any repeats per year. I mix and match them <laughs> and it's always fun for the kids. Okay, so can you explain to me what Pound Pals is probably going to be about? When I wear the Mickey ears, I hope that it shows the joy. It means happiness. We're going to redo it because that's a good part of the chapter. Every day, I try to come in and make sure that I have a great smile on my face and that I'm energetic for these students. And I hope that they see my positivity every day. And I just love doing what I'm doing. And I'm so happy to be here. My classroom has the feel of a family. I want them to feel loved, welcomed, and I want them to respect each other. I really think that my classroom is fun. I try to always engage them in games and things that they enjoy to try to make that personal connection. Um, if they enjoy their learning, they are going to learn more. She took another long breath. Okay. I was up here reading our read aloud, and then I hear the door start to open, and I get to see my beautiful daughter. <laughs> and I just knew something was up. Principal Moretto came in and told me, You are this week's Thank a Teacher recipient. Oh, thank Here's you. your certificate. <laughs> Okay. She is utterly kind and compassionate, and she works harder than anyone we know. The love you show for your students, your passion for teaching, it shows in your smile. All great teachers are not used to getting the accolades, they're better at giving it, and, and every once in a while we gotta say thank you. She's always there for us, she takes care of us. Every time I go to class, she's always happy and always cheers us up. She's just the best teacher. In the words of Mickey Mouse, see you real soon. Hey, Palm Beach County, who will you nominate next? So I have to tell you that the, the nicest thing about the Thank a Teacher Awards that we're giving out is going to the school, seeing the excitement on the students' faces, meeting the teachers' families when we go to honor them. So I just think it's a wonderful opportunity for us to be there for a very happy celebration. So congratulations again to Jenna Brule, and I look forward to the next Thank a Teacher. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Brill. Back on a sad note, our sympathy and prayers to one of our school board secre secretaries, Tiffany Rizell, who's lost her father on Monday. So we send our sympathy to you, Tiffany. On a much happier note, congrats to Vice Chairwoman Brill, who's a grandmother for the first time. Congratulations, Ms. Brill. And a happy birthday to Mrs. Andrews, Ms. Ayala, and Mrs. Whitfield, whose birthday is actually today. What a way to spend your birthday, Mrs. Whitfield. <laughs> That'll take us to our student government rep is not here this evening, so we'll go into committee reports, academic advisory committee. Audit committee is uh, the audit committee and construction oversight review committee reports are attached to the agenda. District diversity and equity committee. Good evening, happy birthday, Ms. Overfield. Uh, good evening, Chair Barbieri, board members, Superintendent Burke, staff, and everyone in your respective places. Charmaine Poster, District Diversity and Equity Chair, also known as DDEC. The DDEC met on February 24th in this boardroom and virtually. At this meeting, the first quarterly report back update on involuntary examinations and mental health response Christ plan was presented by Dr. Mary Claire Musinic. Dr. Musinic provided updates on policy 5.20, student mental health crisis response, including the mandatory compliance training, K professional development requirements, the first mental health crisis transport data from 2021, 2022, internal and external stakeholders collaboration in the JFK Adolescence Intensive Volunteer Outpatient Program. The updates garnish discussions, motions, and recommendations as follows. Recommendation was made by Carrie Whittle from FAU Card for a special education teacher or background to be added on the CAPE team. Recommendation was made by Charmaine Postal from PTA recommending substitutes are included on the list of staff mandated to complete both trainings, policy 5.20, student mental health crisis, and suicide awareness and prevention by the Jason Foundation. Committee member Carrie Whittle also added that school police should be included in these specific trainings as well. 
Recommendation was also made that the district have an equal re relationship with applicable municipal police regarding transport data as currently the only law enforcement agency under both internal and external, external stakeholders is the sheriff's office. Recommendation was made by Marsha Guthrie from the NAACP that the staff should be more explicit when information is shared with parents. Recommendation by Rex Barnes from Compass for district staff to follow up on trainings with JFK regarding gender sexuality. All recommendations were supported and voted by the agencies represented at the meeting unanimously. In addition, two additional motions were brought forth and passed unanimously. One was Kimberly Sparrow, ESC Advisory Committee moved for the DDEC subcommittee to be created to review district training that is provided for district staff and faculty and to provide feedback to district staff and faculty. This subcommittee will begin meeting on March 24th and subsequently every fourth Thursday of each month or the hour prior to DDEC regular meetings from 9 a.m. to 10 a.m. The subcommittee members are Kimberly Sparrow, ESC Advisory, Emmy Kenny. Palm Beach County Human Rights Coalition, Dr. Maria Altana, Hispanic Coalition, Carrie Whittle, and Robin Jones, both from the FAU, FAU card. Lastly, the DDEC approved a change to the start time of our regular scheduled DDEC meeting beginning tomorrow, March 24th. The DDEC will meet from 10 a.m. to 12 p.m. That is a change of time from the 9 to 11 a.m. scheduled time. And we will continue to meet on the fourth Thursday of every month. Thank you. Have a great evening. Thank you. General Counsel, Bernard, do you have anything to report? No report, thank you. Inspector General Michael? No report. All right, we have elected officials and delegates. I want to remind you that uh, I don't like to turn off microphones, so you have four minutes. Um, first, uh, I want to welcome Mayor Shelley Petrolia from Delray Beach, uh, City Manager Terrence Moore, Education Coordinator Janet Meeks, and the Chair of the Education Board of Delray Beach, Mitch Katz. Uh, please come up in any order you would like. Is the mic okay? Can you all hear me fine? Yes. Thank you. My name is Terrence Moore. I'm Derry Beach City Manager as of about eight months now. So I'm fairly new to the city of Derry Beach, but it is, of course, a very robust community. We appreciate the opportunity to be here because I, for one, wish to share a few observations relative to my first nearly year of service, and it does relate to the education sector in the city of Delray Beach and the state of education overall. During the first few months of service, I did make it a priority to visit with educational leadership representing all schools located in the Delray Beach corporate limits, as well as have the opportunity and privilege to interact with school district leadership, individuals such as Dr. Licata and other colleagues and associates of the school district of Palm Beach County. A particular focus, of course, is the current trajectory relative to educational opportunities for the city of Delray Beach, Florida, as well as what's in store for the school district of Palm Beach County to offer leadership and guidance to get us to an absolute best place in which we all possibly can be. Much of that has a focus relative to the Delray Full Service Center, notably the fact that there has been an offer recently made available to the city regarding buildings 1, 2, and 12 much community interest in that regard, and there's a great deal being accomplished to take that under consideration relative to financial matters, as well as logistically what works in the best interest of the community as a whole. Likewise, my interest is to do as much as we possibly can to learn about the state of education in Delray Beach as we continue to do what we can to represent what is in the best interest of the community as a whole. As it relates to the Delray Full Service Center, in the process of getting acquainted with that facility, its background, its history, and future direction, it's come to my attention, objectively and professionally, that there was a lack of a master plan associated with the dots that needed to be connected in this regard. And of course, I've had the opportunity and privilege to offer my thoughts, concerns, and observations to not only the Mayor and City Commission, who I work closely with and represent in my capacity as the city's chief executive, but also working closely with the Stairway Beach Education Board. Likewise, we made it a priority to be here this evening to offer our thoughts, observations, and concerns with the hope that we'll be able to strike a balance and do as much as we possibly can to take advantage of the opportunity 
we all currently enjoy. With that, we have other colleagues that haven't been acknowledged in the introductory remarks. Thank you again for your time and the opportunity to listen to our concerns, thoughts, and hopeful, hopeful, we remain hopeful that we'll be able to collaborate accordingly. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Moore. Good afternoon. Mitch Cat. My name is Mitch Katz. I am chair of the Delray Beach Education Board, and I'm here this evening to speak on their behalf. First, I want to thank you for what you do for our children every day. As a parent of public school children, I just uh, I know what you do, and I, I really appreciate it. The city has had a close working relationship with the school district for more than 30 years. It started in 1990 with the Sharing for Excellent Schools, Excellent Schools Plan, which was an interlocal agreement between the school district and the city of Delray Beach to work collaboratively to help revitalize our schools, enhance facilities, achieve racial balance, and address unique consideration for ed education programs in our schools. It also established a permanent education board to oversee school issues. The City Commission has charged the Delray Beach Education Board to advocate for education-related goals and policies of the City's comprehensive plan and provide them advice and guidance. They also require the board to present them with an annual State of Education report. In November of last year, our education coordinator presented to the Education Board and City Commission the state of education in Delray Beach post-pandemic. The data revealed our schools were under-enrolled, a trend for 10 years, and we had underperforming schools. It was concerning to learn that Pine Grove Elementary, Carver Middle School, and Village Academy are projected to have flat or decreased enrollment over the next five years. We also got new information on economic trends that could provide for unique considerations at Delray Full Service Center with the Penny Sales Tax Construction Project. At the January Delray Beach Education Board meeting, we reviewed the 2015 Interlocal Agreement for Coordinated Planning and realized that the district had never come before our board or the commission to present their plans. So we did not get a chance to analyze Delray Full Service Center and make a formal recommendation to the commission. The board was in consensus that Delray Full Service Center and Village Academy sites should be looked at as a master site to see how the technical high school and college would be and could be developed. We felt that the virtual slideshow presentations made by one school member did not fulfill this requirement of the agreement. The education agreed that a pause was needed while a plan was created. The board voted unanimously to recommend the city, recommend the city commission demand the school district take a pause until we had a joint meeting of the parties and the submission of a site plan and floor plans are submitted to the city as required by the 2015 Interlocal Agreement for Coordinated Planning. However, the resolution that ultimately passed by the commission only urged the district, school district to engage in discussion. There has been, thankfully, a series of discussions, but this is not enough. Delray Full Service Center is being built and architectural plans are being drawn for Pine Grove. Delray Beach is looking for a technical high school and college what we have seen from the four plans is an ESOL and GED testing site, which is contradictory to the slideshows the community has shown. There's $34 million at stake to get it right. Cities like this only get a chance at this once in a 30 to 50 year lifetime. We need to look at our schools under interlocal agreement like we did in 1990 and take a pause. We ask you to take a pause. Thank you, Chairman Getz. Good evening, my name is Janet Meeks and I'm the education coordinator for the city of Delray Beach. And to reiterate what uh, Mitch had to say, um, there is $34 million of taxpayers' money at stake for education. This opportunity to build schools comes around very, very rarely. We need to take a look at our eight schools comprehensively and create an education master plan that includes action steps, responsibilities, time frames with short, medium, and long-term goals. In November of last year, the City Commission charged me to conduct a needs assessment. It revealed Carver Middle School continues in a downward spiral in enrollment, which will leave the school at 39% capacity at Plumosa, after Plumosa adds eighth grade classes in two years. Village Academy Upper School is at 33% capacity and Pine Grove 45% capacity. This data supports the need to study the root causes. Speaking of the money that's coming to the city of that $34,000 is basically allocated for Pine Grove and its and Delray Full Service Center and it's being spent. Pine Grove's architectural drawings we understand are underway and we haven't been contacted by the city to be part of that conversation. Delray Full Service Center is being construction, mm -hmm. 
constructed, and I'm struggling to see how it will become a technical high school and college modeled after Broward County's Atlantic Technical College as promised. Unfortunately, as Mitch said, the school district did not follow the interlocal agreement for coordinated planning that requires plans to be filed with the municipality to review against our comprehensive plan and coordinate with staff so we could assess its impact on our community. The city received a building permit set in January of this year that did not include floor plans or information on the modular buildings. Floor plans for the gym and new building were received in February. And this was the first opportunity the city had a chance to analyze the drawings. This week, I just received data on capacities and enrollment. The 20 square foot building has approximately 51% of the space allocated for educational purposes. The balance is for ex accessory uses such as administration, bathrooms, stairwells, and those type of um, items. Of the 51%, 32% is allocated to trades, 19% is allocated for GED and ESOL classrooms. The gym or community center shows most of the rooms are designated for multi-purpose use with one room or 6% of the building being allocated as a testing lab for education purposes. It has been reported the modulars will contain cosmetology, more ESOL rooms, and an office for career source. The Delray full service site feels more like a glorified adult education facility with little overall square footage allocated to actual educational activities for a technical college. Last year, Atlantic High School graduated 220 students that were not career and college ready. A technical high school would be a great option to change that outcome. However, no information has been provided yet on how the district will convert uh, Village Academy to a technical high school. As design, Dowry Full Service Center will have three neglected historic buildings with no determined use or funding streams for renovation. A large chain link fence that separates it from the new building with a modern architectural elevation the historic gym, and eight portables that will have different architectural styles, and another large chain link fence that separates the site from Village Academy. This site has not been comprehensively planned as a campus or could not possibly be aesthetically pleasing. The city's comprehensive plan emphasized the importance of educational facility placement and planning within the community. Um, the Delray Beach is looking for a new education master plan that is codified in a new Sharing for Excellence in Schools 2022 agreement that we can all agree on before any further construction or planning is conducted in our community. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Meeks. Mayor Petroya. Thank you, and it's, it's, uh, I want to thank everybody for having us here, uh, Chair, uh, Vice Chair, Board Members, and uh, Superintendent. Thank you for having us. As you can see, we have some major concerns from our city, and we're trying to we're trying to make sure that we're vocalizing those to you. And excuse me, and pardon me if I'm repeating some of this, but I think it is worthy of repeat. Uh, student population at Village Academy is shockingly low, shockingly low, and it's not um, going to increase at any time, any time soon. We've also got the Pine Grove Elementary School. These are the two schools, the two very schools in the city of Delray Beach that's going to get $34 million of taxpayer money uh, earmarked towards it. That school is also uh, at capacity that's lower than what should be. We have millions earmarked to the elementary school to shrink it, to shrink it down. Is that really the best use of the taxpayer money? I'm asking you. These are the questions that we have for you when the population of that school shows that it's not going to be increasing, it's decreasing, and we're trying to shrink the school to fit the size of the, of the community instead of maybe looking at it from a different perspective. This is where the experts from Delray Beach come to the city commission and tell us what's going on, and we're here begging you to take a look at this in a different way. I'm not sure if all of you are aware, but there are several historic buildings on the full-service center um, site. And just like West Palm Beach's Roosevelt um, Middle School, Delray's Carver School also has a very rich African-American history. I just learned that there was a grant um, that the school district received for restoration of, of Roosevelt. And that made me question why Carver wasn't involved in that process of getting a, a, a grant request as well. Again, we're just quarantining it off, and we don't have a plan for it. I, I am, for the record, extremely pleased of the forward progress of Roosevelt. Um, I'm a graduate. I attended Roosevelt uh, when it was the junior high school in 1977. That was the best class, by the way. <laughs> but as Delray Beach's mayor, I'm a little envious uh, that the same planning, the same community buy-in, the same collaborative uh, support, 
and the private partnership is absent in my, my town. And I don't understand why one, one community can get such a difference and our community is, is, is not. You may or may not also be aware that a community center is planned for the gym at the full service uh, center, uh, where a uh, village square, village, I'm sorry, village academy. But did you also know that Pompey Park's community center, which is in Delray Beach, located just one mile uh, from the full service center, is undergoing a 30 to 40 million dollar complete reconstruction? We're doing that for the, for the community. So who will support the full service center's community programming and staffing? Isn't this duplicative services? This is where we need to have that back and forth and talk with each other so that we don't have that happening um, in a, in, in a one-mile radius of, of where this is already taking place. Delray's Education Board and Education Coordinator have strongly questioned the direction of the school district's funding, and rightfully so. A master plan, a pandemic, a pre-pandemic has never really been presented to Delray Beach, from my understanding. I have so much more to say, and I know it's very uh, coming to the end. I just want to say, uh, finish it off by saying, major changes in what the Village Academy and the Delray Full Service can be, should be fully explored. A technical college linked to a technical high school is completely doable now, and it would be the first of its kind in Palm Beach County for the school district. This is a legacy opportunity for the school district, for Delray Beach, and for Palm Beach County as a whole. And I'm going to end there because I don't want you cutting me off. Thank you very much. Thank you, Madam Mayor. James Gavrilos, President and CEO of the Education Foundation. Claudia Kirk Bartow, Junior Achievement, Palm Beach Treasure Coast. Laura Fellman, Palm Beach County PTA, PTSA. Dr. Robinson. So thank you. Before the um, city officials from Delray leave, um, so yeah, you know we're talking about that technical high school and college. So come with us. We're going to do it. I just took another contingent to Broward to see it in action. So yeah, let's talk. Let's work it out. Yeah, it's always been the plan. Good evening, members of the school board, Chairman Barbieri and Superintendent Burke. Uh, two updates tonight, one on the digital inclusion plan. Um, I, I do have to commend the work of Dr. Adam Miller and his entire team. Uh, they've been amazing partners. As we are still configuring Wi-Fi extenders, I'm pleased to announce to this body that two more business partners have joined in to volunteer uh, to spend a day configuring Wi-Fi extenders, Vertical Bridge Holdings and LexisNexis Risk Solutions. The LexisNexis group is going to be their CEOs from all over the country are flying into Palm Beach County for a series of corporate meetings, and they've built into their program this volunteer experience. Uh, the team here at the school district, Melissa Tuno, uh, and certainly Dr. Miller, will be bringing down uh, the equipment needed for these people to spend the day configuring those Wi-Fi extenders as that program moves forward. Tomorrow at 9 o'clock, we are holding a panel discussion where we will update all of the funders on the progress. We will have representatives from Palm Beach County, Michael Butler, uh, the school district, Dr. Miller, and then myself and Jennifer Etheridge, uh, just kind of updating the donors. And I want to thank, I believe, uh, Ms. Ayala and Ms. Andrews. You have registered for that panel, so we look forward to Zooming with you bright and early in the morning. The second thing that I would want to update you tonight is to talk a little bit about Red Apple Supplies. Um, I come up every month and I throw a bunch of huge numbers at you, a million of this and six million of that and 500,000 of this, and, and sometimes we forget it's about individual people. Chairman Barbieri, I, want to, I, I do need to cite your leadership. Um, you're a man of bold vision, and you've, through these horrifically two years, you've had the bold vision of, of moving the district forward in your role as board chair, but you also have this unique ability to see the needs of individual people. You shared with us that there are two families who have come to us from the Ukraine, and yesterday they were at Red Apple Supply. And it's a fam two families, one of them has uh, two 12-year-old twins, a boy and a girl, uh, and a five-year-old boy. There's another family with a nine-year-old girl uh, it got personal for me. She shares my daughter's name, Anastasia, or Anastasia, if you will. And to see these young people who 10 days ago were in Kiev, and today they're in a Palm Beach County public school. And yesterday they were at Red Apple Supply getting everything they need, that these young people could, could walk into class and fit in with the rest of their contemporaries and have the tools they need to succeed. What these children have seen, no one should see. 
and yet they have been welcomed by this school district with open arms. And I must commend you, Chairman Barbieri, for getting to me and saying, get this done. You have that unique ability to see the big picture, but also the details. Your support, and now I speak to the entire board, your support of our Red Apple Supplies is astounding and indeed inspiring. I want to thank you uh, for approving in your consent agenda the ground lease. Next month, I'm going to share with you the plans. We have talked about this now for over a year. We at the Ed Foundation have been working on a capital campaign as well as a design. And in the coming months or year, we are going to construct a 20,000 square foot facility on that property, which will allow us to serve every one of our district schools. In five to seven years, no teacher in Palm Beach County will ever again have to dip into their pocket to buy school supplies. I'm joined tonight by the real brains behind the Ed Foundation. To my immediate left, Jim Moore, our chairman of the board from United Healthcare, and to his left is Teresa Dabrowski, who kind of does everything. Uh, Teresa is our chief engagement officer. In the next few months, you're going to be seeing a lot of Teresa because she's not only running the capital campaign, she, along with Meredith Trim, our board member, are actually designing the building uh, with Song and Associates. I would share with you that design is all, uh, almost done. Our marketing plan is practically completed. Our capital campaign is ready to go, and we will share with you some of that at the April meeting. What I want to say to you tonight, members of this board, we are ready. We're excited. The future starts today. Thank you for your support of Red Apple Supplies and all we do. Thank you, President Gavrilos. Mr. Gavrilos, I just want to thank you also. Um, I called you on Friday, and within an hour, you arranged for that, those kids to not only get supplies, but arrange for them to get clothing and shoes. Uh, so I appreciate how fast you worked on that. I understand the kids were able to start school today, so thanks for helping them get uh, situated. Good evening, Chairman Barbieri, Vice Chair Brill, board members, and Superintendent Burke. Um, and happy birthday, Erica. Junior Achievement of the Palm Beaches and Treasure Coast is proud to continue to support teachers and students in Palm Beach County Schools. And to date, because I always do have to give you the numbers, we've served 27,811 students in 600, over 600 individual classrooms, kindergarten through 12th grade, have been delivered by over 400 community volunteers. This means that our local students received over 65,000 hours of instruction, which has helped to inspire and prepare our young people to succeed. Junior Achievement was also thrilled yesterday when Governor DeSantis signed the bill mandating financial literacy education for our students in Florida, requiring students to have basic financial planning to understand the importance of credit and grow entrepreneurship within our state directly supports Junior Achievement's mission to prepare young people to succeed. This bill will enhance the work of Junior Achievement, and JA is excited to partner with the district to bring this essential programming to fruition to ensure all Palm Beach County graduates are prepared for their economic futures. Also, Junior Achievement continues to partner with schools throughout the county. The week before spring break, yes, they were all excited for spring break, but we were in multiple schools with JA in a day. We were at Crystal Lakes Elementary School, and the principal, Dr. Green, hosted the JA High School Heroes from Park Vista to serve her K-2 to two classrooms, and community volunteers and parent volunteers to teach programs to the third through fifth, fifth graders. Additionally, JA supported UB Kinsey Elementary by recruiting and training volunteers from Plan Hub, right down the street from the school, to teach the students in kindergarten, first, and second grade. The volunteers had a great time supporting our local students and instilling career readiness lessons for all primary students. And thank you, a shout out to Mr. Bembry um, for allowing us to come in. We also were grateful for the opportunity to present to our our essential programs to all the principals at their March Principals Leadership Academy meeting. JA's team enjoyed sharing our mission with school leaders and look forward to expanding programming into new schools and continuing to increase our impact throughout the county. And I did want to say that was a lot in four minutes to share about all of our 23 programs <laughs> with all of the principals. So thank you again for that, that opportunity. And we look forward to continuing to bring workforce readiness, financial literacy, and entrepreneurship programs to all of our K-12 students. So thank you all very much. Thank you, Ms. Barto, for all your help with our kids. Thank you very much. Uh, Laura Fellman, the 
Palm Beach County PTA, PTSA. Hi, good, good evening. Um, I'm going to take a couple of minutes and uh, speak to you as chair of the Academic Advisory Committee first, and then I'll speak to you as president of Palm Beach County Council. So good evening, Chairman Barbieri, school board members, Superintendent Burke, and staff. The Academic Advisory Committee attempted to meet for both February and March meetings, but unfortunately we were not able to achieve a quorum. Thus, we did not hold these meetings. I want to take a moment again to thank the staff for their efforts to prepare for the meetings and attend them. And I also want to thank the members who did um, come last Monday, this past Monday, um, who were present for the non-meeting, which were, which were Ms. Tibbs, Ms. Frischberg, Ms. Gabrielle, Ms. Durandis, Ms. Postal, and Ms. Coleman. Um, I really appreciate that you all took the time and while we were trying to wait for just one more person to show up so we could have a quorum and be able to hold our discussion and give our input as we really want to be able to do. I hope that in the future the appointees who did not attend will be able to attend so that we can achieve a quorum and do the work of the committee. Now as County Council President. Hold on one second. Would you restart the time for that uh, for her presentation? Go ahead, ma'am. Thank you so much. Good evening again. Um, I'd like to take a moment to let you know that PTA's hearts and prayers go out to those who were involved in the terrible traffic accident. PTA stands with the community as an advocate for the safety and well-being of our students, both in and out of the classroom. On another note, Jen Martinez from Florida PTA sends her regards. She also asked me to let you know that while the legislative session has ended, PTA's advocacy efforts are year-round. We are currently preparing for the annual leadership convention in July and look forward to the in-person event. It will be held in Orlando. We are keeping in close contact with the Florida Department of Education to learn more about the new assessment program that will be released this fall for the school year of 2020, 2023. From Palm Beach County Council of PTAs, we are getting ready for our election of our officers for our next term and for our end of the year celebration on May 6th. Please stay tuned for new information. We also are having an event on April 26th with the Palm Beach County Health Coalition, focusing on empowering parents and guardians with safety and health information. For more information about this, please email palmbeach.cc at floridapta.org. As with our community, the concerns about safety in schools are ever present in our minds. With that concern, we would also request and ask that we have training for the officers who will be serving in schools to focus on community building, working with students, and most specifically working with students who have disabilities. Thank you all for your time. Thank you, Ms. Feldman. Justin Katz, president of CTA, Classroom Teachers Association. Good evening, school board. My name is Justin Katz. I'm the president of the Teachers Union, the Classroom Teachers Association. Um, I wanted to, to come here tonight to speak uh, briefly on two issues. One is an agenda item you have later. Um, in, in all my time up here, I've never spoken on a personnel addendum before, but um, I wanted to tonight, um, generically speaking, to uh, thank the superintendent and the current leadership for uh, finding a qualified candidate to run the Human Resources Department. Um, I'll keep it brief, but in previous years prior to current leadership, uh, concerns that had been raised about the Human Resources Department had, had gone unheeded um, to the point that, you know, our relationship had become toxic and there are consequences that have played out in recent years that we're all aware of. Uh, we look forward to working with, um, pending your approval, the new Director of Human Resources, um, and, and it's often spoken of that, that we are the largest employer in Palm Beach County. That means that we have the most important human resources department in Palm Beach County and it needs to be up to spec. So thank you for that. Uh, beyond that issue, uh, you know we have negotiations that start next week regarding salaries for this year. A lot of the workshop pertain to um, mental health and well-being, not just of students, but of employees. I can tell you that uh, CTA is prepared as always, to make offers during negotiations for compensation that are within the district's capabilities and that pay respect to your employees. There are lots of things you could probably conjure up as a byproduct of your strategic plan to help your employees with their mental health. 
and the morale, but I can tell you that one of the number one things that will help them is the feeling of appreciation and the feeling of financial security so that their family is safe and taken care of in their profession and they don't have to consider walking away and increasing the already high attrition rates. So we look forward to negotiations next week. And again, thank you for all you do. Thank you, Mr. President. Board members, I forgot to, uh, to advise you that I met with the superintendent to discuss the uh, security issues that have been recently brought to our attention and the superintendent has agreed to schedule a security mission, uh, meeting for the board as soon as possible so that we can ask questions and get answers to any issues that we might have, uh, have uh, you know, questions about, uh, as well as bring us up to, sp up to speed on the, the uh, status of how many officers we have in the different municipalities and government agencies that are helping us um, secure the schools. Ms. Ayala, I understand you had something. Yes, thank you. Uh, I would like to take a point of personal privilege to make a motion to take COM2, let's move out of order, a vote on the agenda item and allow the executive director of Digital Vibes, Will Romulus, who is here tonight to take the proclamation. So I move to take it out of order. We have a second on that is by Dr. Robinson. Any discussion? All in favor? Opposed? Motion carries 7-0. Thank you. We need a, does any board member want to pull anything else from consent? We need a motion to approve the consent agenda. Motion by Mrs. Whitfield, seconded by Mrs. Ms. Ayala. All in favor? Opposed? Motion carries 7-0. I guess that takes us to the item that Mrs. Whitfield, or Ms. Ayala just uh, moved to the top of the agenda. Yes, COM2, correct? Yes. Yes. I recommend the board proclaim March 2022 as Let's Move Palm Beach County Month. Motion by Ms. Ayala, seconded by Mrs. Whitfield. Discussion? Ms. Ayala. Thank you. Whereas the school district of Palm Beach County takes special notice and acknowledges exceptional organizations that help residents who live, work, and play within the jurisdiction, and whereas local organizations reach out to underserved youth in Palm Beach County by empowering them through dance, fitness, technology, and the arts, and whereas the Let's Move Commit to Change Physical Activity Challenge is a countywide initiative that focuses on physical activity, nutrition, and healthy behaviors, and whereas the challenge takes place annually from March 1st through 31st and encourages individuals within and beyond Palm Beach County to take charge of their health by participating in fun fitness exercises, and whereas the Let's Move initiative was originally introduced on a national level by then First Lady Michelle Obama in 2010 with the goal of decreasing childhood obesity throughout the United States, and whereas nearly one in three children in the United States are overweight or obese, and if this problem persists, one third of all children born in 2000 or later will suffer from diabetes at some point in their lives, or will face other obesity-related health problems, such as heart disease, high blood pressure, asthma, and cancer. Now, therefore, be it resolved that the Superintendent and School Board of Palm Beach County do hereby proclaim March 2022 as Let's Move Palm Beach County Month and urges all citizens to join us in moving to improve their fitness, mental health, and overall health. Done this 23rd day of March 2022 in West Palm Beach, Florida. And I think Mr. Romulus is here to accept the proclamation. Is there any other discussion? All in favor? Opposed? Motion carries 7 0. CO 1, Mr. Superintendent. Yes, I recommend the board proclaim March 2022 as Women's History Month. Motion by Ms. Ayala, seconded by Mrs. Andrews. We'll do it after. Go ahead. Okay. 
So this is the Proclamation for Women's History Month, March 2022. Whereas American women of every race, class, and ethnic background served as early leaders in the forefront of every major progressive social change movement and Whereas American women of every race, class, and ethnic background have made historic contributions to the growth and strength of our nation in countless recorded and unrecorded ways. And whereas American women have played and continue to play a critical economic, cultural, and social role in every sphere of the life of the nation by constituting a significant portion of the labor force working inside and outside of the home, and whereas, during Women's History Month, we recall that the pioneering legacy of our grandmothers and great-grandmothers is revealed not only in our museums and history books, but also in the fierce determination and limitless potential of our daughters and granddaughters. And whereas, we make headway on the critical, crucial issues of our time, let the courageous vision championed by women of past generations inspire us to defend the dreams and opportunities of those to come. Now, therefore, be it resolved that the superintendent and school board of Palm Beach County do hereby proclaim March 2022 as Women's History Month and encourage all district students and employees to observe this month and celebrate International Women's Day on Tuesday, March 8, 2022, with appropriate programs, ceremonies, and activities that honor the history, accomplishments, and contributions of women. Done this 23rd day of March, 2022, in West Palm Beach, Florida. Any discussion? All in favor? Opposed? Motion carries 7 0. I'll call on the uh, agenda topic speakers now. I've got six of you, so I'll call three at a time. Come up to the podium in any order that you get there Kimberly Spire O, Danielle Underwood, and Charmaine Postal. Please state your name for the record and watch the clock. Good evening, Chairman Barbieri, Board Member Superintendent, Charmaine Postal, Mother of Four, District 5, speaking this evening regarding Agenda Item SP1, um, Agreement for Law Enforcement Services with Palm Beach County Sheriff's Office. In review of the Agreement for Law Enforcement Services by and between the Palm Beach County Sheriff's Office and the School Board of Palm Beach County, I'm concerned on whether or not the district is being fiscally responsible. In the contract, page four, article five, consideration beginning March 22nd, the sheriff shall be compensated for each deputy at the rate of $100 per hour and $135 per hour for each sergeant. I'm assuming the two sergeants are because of the industry standards um, of the one to seven ratio, right? So is this contract pertaining to schools that are only in the PBSO jurisdiction? Given that the school police had roughly 68 vacancies where the other 46 vacancies filled by school police or will be filled by municipalities. If so, in the event that additional vacancies come in the respective municipalities, will industry standards be met by the municipality sergeants as this contract is outlined for the sheriff? As from my understanding, municipalities can contract for less than the proposed contract for the sheriff office. Not always the case, but certainly the case in several um, municipalities. So will we or have we considered contracting with municipalities, cities? I was told don't call them just city police. Also, under the contract review as to form and legal sufficiency checklist, it stated that the contract with PBSO was not consistent with applicable policies included but not limited to the procurement policies and PBSO did not agree to include inspe inspector general clause in this contract. What is the clause and why does PBSO want to exclude it from the contract? Lastly, while this contract is being fulfilled, will there be continuous, recu there be continuous recruitment for school officers? There are so many more possible questions and concerns and I trust that you guys, you all are making the best decisions to meet the Marjorie Stoneman Douglas Act needs and the needs of our students here at Palm Beach County School District. The only acts that I truly would like for us to see would better communication and a little bit of transparency to the community. Because when you have optics, when you have media, when you have all of those individuals who don't really understand 
and I don't understand everything, um, we speculate. We start asking questions. So if we communicate and we, trans and we are transparent, we will have less <laughs> chaos in the boardroom. Um, so that's, that's all I'm asking. Thank you. Kimberly Spiro, Danielle Underwood. Amanda Silvestri. Amanda Silvestri. I'm here in support of our school police and the students and teachers in our public schools, and also as a concerned parent. I will read a few comments from a survey that is ongoing and has only been circulated for about a week. We will give it a month and hand it over with our responses to the board. One, PBSO is the clear authority for law enforcement in Palm Beach County. PBSO has more resources and manpower to get the job done. A merger is the only clear and logical answer to fixing this unfortunate circumstance. How is it that the board can afford to pay outside agencies three times the amount they pay school board police officers not give officers a fair raise, and also withhold a paycheck in July. An entire overhaul of the department needs to be done. The board members need to stop playing politics with the safety of our children and merge with the sheriff's office. The board looks at us as though they, we belong to them. Like most of us, I voted last year at the PBA meeting in favor of asking to go with PBSO. Now more than ever, I feel it is not only a good idea, but necessary. Educational administrators ability to impede and interfere with law enforcement officers ability to execute their lawful duties. One more thing, retaliation, retaliation, retaliation will have you not be able to move forward with this agency. The lack of critical staffing, poor radio operations, limited or no advanced training, limited or no police rifles to officers, low morale and continual change in leadership this overall deterioration of the school board police department is failing both students and staff members. The protection of our students and staff members is a no fail mission. We cannot have an ineffective school police department in today's environment. Morale is extremely bad and there seems to be no light at the end of the tunnel. Also from the survey, 86% thus far feel dissatisfied with the district's ability to manage them. 100% support a complete merger with Palm Beach County Sheriff's Office and 91% fear retaliation from the board if their voices, if they voice issues that interfere with serving and protecting the schools. Lastly, I have a few questions and would appreciate hearing a discussion when the time for that occurs tonight. Will the hiring of 20 officers be a temporary fix? Are you still likely to consider the merger? Is this a fiscally responsible thing to do? How will this solve the training issue and the radio communication issue? Does this proposal on the table fully staff our schools? And is this really the answer to keep our precious children and their teachers safe? Thank you. Alexandra Burke and Jen Showalter. Hi, my name is Alexandra. I want to talk about IG1. I believe you were doing observation of school buses safety devices. I'm just puzzled, maybe you notice something else because it's not all school buses problem. Unfortunately, I don't have a county information because it's usually a big secret for tax, tax, from taxpayers. Only can talk about Sunrise Park Elementary. Buses are constantly late, at least four times a week. And I used to delete all this information, now everything saved on my phone. And, uh, and delays are not five, 10 minutes. It's usually 20, 30, 40 minutes or more. Our family gave up on school bus services because it's not reliable. My son has volunteer responsibility and cannot be late. So as a result, I'm paying for something which I can't use because of poor service. Is it time to start actively looking for a new service provider? 
Any person in real world would do it, but our board is completely unaware of this issue. I know I will never get any answers from you. I can only imagine the reasons why you're keeping this poor service. Is it part of your diversity policy? Is a parent I demanding to choose vendors based on service quality, not on race or gender? Mr. Burke, you failed again. Sorry. You were bragging last meeting about installing Wi-Fi spots on the buses. I did leg work for you. I was actually asked 78 students, nobody using it. What a waste of time, what a waste of money. And by the way, for your information, reading in the bus triggering emotion sickness, which include Cold sweats, dizziness, nausea, nausea, and vomiting. Do you know that? My opinion, you're not qualified for your position. What a waste of your 300K. Thank you. Hi, I'm Jen Schulter, mother of three, here to talk about several agenda items, including CEW1 and T6. There are a, mo a, a mountain of spending issues that we could talk about. And one of the projects that I'd like to talk about is the medical agreement with Genesis for providing medical services to Atlanta Community High School. What are they offering? It mentions prescribing medication. Does this include pregnancy tests, birth control, gender identity, transforming drugs? Are parents notified? Um, if we're supporting the whole person, then spiritual health needs to be included. Uh, the agreements are expensive for churches to use school space just for the weekends. But according to the published lease agreement, Genesis will pay the school board $1 per year for that space, including electricity, water, natural gas, garbage disposal, and sewer in the rent. And the telephone and internet services are provided by the school board. The district website doesn't mention this agreement. The flyer is not obvious or upfront on the school's website. The services are vague, and it does also include dental services. Uh, why is this not better publicized? The public deserves an open communication about outside medical providers providing and getting free access to our children. I plan on filing a FOIA request for more information as this has wide ranging impacts. The board used 28 elementary schools for vaccination sites, but dropped the listing of the schools recently. Now, Genesis, the board is more than happy to bring health providers to provide health services, but what about Spectrum kids, uh, kids that are special needs? They desperately need sensory rooms and other items to be able to function and learn, but where are they? The district is, um, if the district is going to be a medical provider, then they need to start on issues that directly affect academic achievement. And uh, the mission statement, um, <laughs> you know, it, you're supposed to be doing academics, not being medical providers. Meanwhile, your failing proficiencies are ignored. U.S. News and World Report lists 28 out of 100 college ready index, but the board has a 94.9% a graduation rate. Add in the reports from local OT and teachers who state that our students across the board are two to three grades behind. The board is literally pushing the kids out the door without a full education. Um, if we can't afford buses for all the athletes and music groups for competitions or classroom supplies or fix the officer radios so that they can be, our kids can be secure, then you should not be going on these um, business trips like to Nashville or Poland. The math, math curriculum um, was not a transparent process. A lot of people who signed up to review were not notified or allowed to participate. Our children should not have to put out fights like at Royal Palm Beach, where 10 people were sent to the hospital and pepper, pepper spray was used. So let's have the PPSO absorb the police. Thank you. Board members, we need a vote to reconsider the uh, consent agenda. So I didn't give everybody the opportunity to pull. So we need a, a motion to reconsider the uh, consent agenda vote. Motion by Ms. Ayala, second by Mr. Whitfield. Any discussion? All in favor, opposed, 7-0. Does any board member want to pull anything from the consent agenda at this time? All right. Well. Um, um, excuse me, I'm confused. Are you still going to have um, SP1 pulled? SP1's already been pulled. Okay, thank you. 
All right. There's no, nothing. I'll take a motion to approve the consent agenda. Motion by Mrs. Andrews, seconded by Mrs. Whitfield. Any discussion? All in favor? Opposed? Motion carries 7 0. So, Mr. Superintendent, that'll take us to, I believe, COM 3. Yes. I recommend the board proclaim April 2022 as School Library Month. Motion by Mrs. Whitfield, seconded by Mrs. Andrews. Discussion? Somebody reading that one? No, sir. Okay. All in favor? Opposed? Motion carries 7 0. P2, Mr. Two. Superintendent. I recommend the board approve the personnel addendum as amended. Motion by Mrs. Andrews, seconded by Dr. Robinson. Any discussion? All in favor? Opposed? Motion carries 7 0. SP1. I recommend the board approve the proposed agreement for law enforcement services with the Palm Beach County Sheriff's Office and authorize the superintendent and board chairman to execute the agreement substantially in the form attached and any future modifications. Motion by Mrs. Whitfield, seconded by Mrs. Andrews. Discussion? Dr. Robinson? Thank you. Um, so I pulled this because I have a couple of concerns. Um, let me just start with this. While <clears throat> there's a lot of literature out there that would suggest that having law enforcement on school campuses has its downside. I know we, we it makes us more safe in one respect, um, but just to acknowledge that there's, there's a difference of opinion um, that is actually supported with some degree of research. Having said that, I fully support our school police. I have been here long enough to see the evolution of our school police. Our school police are a specialty unit, right? And I used to say that they're not the slam them up against the wall and cuff them Johnny law enforcement officers. They're the ones who um, almost become part of the students, um, well, not even almost, oftentimes they're, they're trusted adult, right? They oftentimes keep the campuses safe because of those relationships and because um, they become part of the school community as opposed to just law enforcement. Um, and, I, and I've seen the progression and I'm, I'm really, really, really um, pleased um, with the things that I've seen happen over time. Now, having said that, I do also understand um, the shortage nationally of law enforcement officers. I understand that. I understand that we are competing for law enforcement officers, um, and I understand that we want to keep our schools staffed. Um, so having said that, I have a couple of questions and then a couple of suggestions. Um, and at this moment in time, I'm still not certain if I'm going to support this recommendation. But um, so, Mr. Burke, I know that we had relationships with other law enforcement agencies and that they were helping to staff our schools. Um, if you could just maybe give us a, a bit of update on where we are with other law enforcement agencies and that I would request a follow-up in writing on who we have relationships with, when those contracts expire, how many officers we currently have and what schools they're in. But now if you can just give us a... Yes. a so the board will recall, you know, in the wake of the Stoneman Douglas tragedy, we contracted with several agencies throughout the county uh, to shore up our security as we were. And with the passage of the referendum, we, we aspired to double the size of our department. So we used those contracts and we had a very successful recruiting campaign. You know, we hired over 100 officers. And once we got kind of fully staffed, we, we backed off those agreements. They were always seen as kind of a temporary measure. Uh, this year, because of the national shortage, because of you know, our recruitment efforts have not been as successful as, as of late, and we're working to remedy that and kind of revisiting our approach. Uh, but we have been contracting with about a half dozen agencies Right now, uh, the sheriff will actually be the seventh agency. Uh, we have agreements with West, West Palm Beach, Jupiter, Boynton, Delray, Boca Raton, and Palm Beach Gardens. Uh, so combined, they're going to provide us about 32 officers, with the sheriff now kicking in 20 of those 32. Uh, we have enough off officers within Palm Beach County, our own force, to cover the schools, but we don't like getting this thin. 
uh, we want to be prepared. You know, sometimes we, if we have a resignation or retirement, we want to have a little more depth. Uh, we want to double down on our recruitment efforts because we see this as a stopgap short-term measure. Uh, we are committed to our department. You know, I've talked to some of the officers. We're trying to, you know, compensation is always important. Uh, in the past, we've, we've looked at our officers' pay rate by the hour, and it compares, you know, we're not at the top, but we're in the, we're in the range. Uh, but I think the reality is we all see how expensive it is to live in Palm Beach County. Right. The, the good and the bad of being a school police officer could be the schedule, right? Uh, our hours are pretty predictable. You know, we follow the school calendar. Uh, but it's basically a 10-month job where other agencies are 12-month jobs. And I can understand that if a, a young you know, officer is trying to support, help support their family, that they may be prefer to work 12 months because they want to make as much money as possible. Uh, so I think we need to look at that. And uh, mm -hmm. along with if there's any opportunities to redirect resources within school police to <laughs> improve our compensa compensation. Uh, but yeah, so this, and also I want to just kind of maybe clear up one thing I've heard that's getting a little misconstrued. Uh, the rates that we pay either the sheriff or these other departments, that's not the rate that goes into their officer's pocket. That's, that's the rate we pay the agency, and the agency then takes that rate and pays for the, the officer, the officer's benefits, the, the vehicle, their equipment, their training, their, you know, their oversight and supervision. So uh, it's not an ideal situation. We'd much prefer to have our own force fully staffed, and that is our, that's our goal, and that continues to be our goal, and we'll be working hard towards it. Just one more now, and then um, I'm sure my colleagues have questions or comments, and then I have some comments to follow. But um, so just to be clear, for each of these agencies, including the sheriff, they they would it would be as needed over the, a certain period of time, and only in their jurisdiction. So West Palm Beach PD would only cover schools in West Palm Beach, for example. Yes, absolutely. Each agency stays, including the sheriff, will stay within their jurisdiction. Okay. I defer to my colleagues for now. Ms. Brill, then Ms. Andrews. Thank you. So I will support Mr. Burke's recommendation, but I don't believe it goes far enough. As some of my colleagues will remember, I twice formally asked that this board direct prior superintendents to explore a merger with the Palm Beach County Sheriff's Office. Those requests failed. When Dr. Fenoy was here, I was prepared to informally bring up the conversation again but I withdrew the request. I won't rehash the conversations. What I will say is that the world has changed since I joined this school board. I firmly believe that any concerns with the merger could be addressed in the contract with the sheriff. I also firmly believe that it would be to the district's benefit to move school safety to the sheriff and allow us to focus on our core mission of education. So I again support the agenda item, SP1, but I regret it does not meet what I perceive to be our needs. Now, I do have some other concerns with the contract, but um, I understand from Mr. Burke that we are looking to, there are other things that are being worked on, um, but I will support him. Um, but I do hope that one day this board will support my recommendation and move forward with the, with the merger, with the sheriff's office, so that we can focus again on academics, on student achievement, and on education. Thank you. Mrs. Andrews? Thank you. Uh, I'd like to say that um, we are good with what we do within our school district. I do love the school district police. I was a teacher, a principal, and I know the value of what they do on the ground within our schools. But we are in a different day. Uh, just this past year, I've worked a lot with the sheriff's office uh, in Belle Glade, uh, in Royal Palm Beach, and right now with the situation that we're dealing with with the accident. Uh, the sheriff brings expertise that we don't have here uh, with our offices within the school district. I've had a conversation with the sheriff. Uh, I know many of the sheriff offices myself because I'm on the ground with them in neighborhoods. And I know that when we come together with school police and the sheriff's office, there's just so far our school police can go where the sheriff can take it to another level. I'm worried about another uh, Marjorie Stoneman Douglas event 
because I believe we've got to have everything in place. When I hear about surveys of people being disgruntled, I need to know the facts on that. I'm not interested in uh, what somebody in the audience is saying, Mr. Burke. I want to know how our school police officers feel. If they feel that they don't have the equipment they need to keep us safe, I need to know that. I'm in a lot of schools, and I work with the sheriff's office a lot in District 6. That's all of our, uh, our uh, security measures for all of the cities. The villages in District 6 are run by the Palm Beach County Sheriff's Office. So I do know them, and I know what we do with the school district. I'm going to support this, but I really want us to come back and look at the monies we're spending right here within the district administratively, as well as what we're paying our offices. I want to know exactly if we decide to go with the, membership, with the Sheriff's Office, how does that compare with what we're doing now and what kind of services can we get? I think we're at a time to discuss this. Thank you, Mr. Barbieri, for saying that we will have some sessions about some things that we're concerned about. I'm concerned because I've been on the ground and I've saw some mistakes from our school district police office when we've had some real serious tragedies within District 6. So now my voice is different from the standpoint of listening to the sheriffs on the ground with me in crisis this year, just this year, and what we could have done differently as a school board and a school district police department to have made it better for some kid that may have had a tragedy. So we've got to do better. I want to know how much we're putting in overhead for administration. If we can eliminate some of that money and pay the people correctly for the school board, because most of these people will be still in office if we merge it with the sheriff's office. They're going to be hiring our people, and we're all doing the same kind of thing. I just notice when I'm working with the sheriff's office uh, on the ground, especially in, in Wellington and the Glades region and all over the place in District 6, I'm very comfortable with them uh, working with our schools because guess what? They're working on all the stuff that's happening within our school where people are getting arrested for doing these things that relate to mental health and the fights and the confusion. Much of that is actually farmed out to the sheriff's office when somebody goes to jail. So we've got to kind of put it all together and figure out where we are today. Uh, for my years of being here, I would say I would never, ever say that I would consider it, but yes, now I can because I've been involved in some major situations this year where I was just thankful that I knew the sheriff's office officials who helped me through a lot of situations. So, y'all, we've got to get make sure we get these 20 to, to get our uh, schools in order, but we need to go back and reevaluate everything that we're doing. We've had a lot of different chiefs to come and go, and they've had their own idea of what that model looks like. We need to now look at what a model will look like for us pre-pandemic, pandemic, and now working out of a pandemic with mental health crisis everywhere, and what we need to be able to work together. And I just think the sheriff brings that law enforcement piece that we truly need right now more than ever before. I love the school police who brings that counseling piece and they're going to still be with us, and we've got to merge it together so we can get the best benefit for our children. So I can support this, but I'm waiting to hear uh, what we're going to do differently as we uh, look at all of these children, many of them going through mental crisis, our adults going through mental crisis. Our police officers are frightened. When you see things happening and they're acting the way they do because they may feel that they can't even protect themselves. So I really want a situation where I know police feel comfortable, they're not upset because of some survey. They're saying they don't have the equipment. They don't have what they need to be able to do the job. They're not making the money to feed their families. All that needs to be cleaned up. I need to know that we're going to look at a model that's going to take care of our police officers. If we stay with the school district, if we're going with the sheriff, it needs to be something where everybody can feel like they're being respected and they can do the job, the number one job to keep our children safe. So I'm going to support this, but I'm asking for additional information, additional meetings where we can look at all the money that's being spent, what the sheriff is asking for, uh, if we do this merger and go that route. I know this is extensive, Mr. Burke, and you told me you tried to work it down, those numbers, but we're, we are where we are right now, and we've got to make sure everybody's safe. But I don't want any time to lapse before we have a discussion where we can look at all the monies from the sheriff's side or what he wants, what we're doing, and I want to know how are our school 
board police, how are they doing? How are they doing mentally? When I'm hearing people saying that they're so upset and so uh, confused about how they're being treated. If we have that going on in here, that needs to stop. And I'm willing to work on making that stop. Whether we do this tonight, I think we have to do it, but we need to make sure going for the future that we make some changes. And I think some changes have to be made. Mr. Burt, we've talked a little bit about it. And I'm really sad about a lot of things that's happening with our schools, with our children, with the mental health, with our police officers. They need counseling because of how they feel about what they're doing. So we all have to come together. The sheriff told me he's willing to work with you, Mr. Burr. That's what he said to me. Ms. Andrews, I'm not trying to take over school police. But he recognizes, and I recognize it now since I'm on the ground. I'm not sitting here reading a letter. I'm on the ground. And I see what the sheriff has done to help us, and I see what our school police officers are doing. So we've got to come together one way or the other to keep our children safe. And I'm willing to be on the front line to make sure that I can stand for that. Mr. Superintendent? Yeah, I'd just like to share with the board, you know, I'm committed to getting you accurate information, factual information, and we, we don't always get that from our speakers. Uh, we don't always get that from surveys that we didn't sanction. Uh, Tonight, you know, I heard from four speakers from the city of Delray. There's some misinformation that was shared by them, and we'll follow up with that and, you know, communicate and collaborate and get the facts on the table. Uh, I do want to say that uh, upon becoming superintendent, uh, Sheriff Bradshaw was very gracious, and he met with me and has been very supportive. He also shared with me that he did not have interest in taking over our police department but he was willing to lend me his best advice with 50 years of experience in law enforcement, and I took it to heart. Uh, I think we enjoy uh, a much improved relationship with the sheriff. Uh, I credit Chief McCutcheon as when he became our interim chief. Uh, he's got a good track record of being someone that's <laughs> easy to work with. He had a career with the sheriff's office, and I think under his leadership, we've also seen much improved communication and collaboration. And our police department, we recognize our role as school police. We're, we're not trying to be the sheriff. You know, uh, when there's serious crimes or if there's a missing persons or what have you, or if there's an emergency, it's all hands on deck. We have a mutual aid agreement. You know, all of the police departments across Palm Beach County are ready to come to our aid. So, you know, we've heard some enough things being battered around that, uh, and we are scheduling a closed door session because it's, security related and some of these items are sensitive. So we will I will work with the chief and Mr. Bogus. We will get the board all the facts and, uh, and bring that to you in the immediate future. Thank you, Mr. Superintendent. Mrs. Whitfield. Thank you so much. Um, I just wanna take this moment to push back a little bit on some of the things my colleagues have said. Um, I feel like I remember sitting in that room right there when Marjorie Stoneman Douglas happened. Uh, we were all at a board meeting that day. Many people were here. Um, and the things that were said after that was, thank God we have our own police because our own police um, had done such a great job of protecting us. And I've watched them protect us. They have um, stopped so many things from happening within um, our schools because of the relationships that they have with our students. Now. It doesn't mean that I don't like PBSO. I have really been grateful because PBSO actually came into my town. Um, when I first lived there, we had Lake Worth Beach Police or Lake Worth Police at the time, and they moved on to PBSO. I think they're doing a fabulous job in Lake Worth. I'm glad to have them. I'm not unhappy that we're going to have this contract today. I think having this contract gives us that relationship with PBSO that I think is a very good uh, place for us to be. We should be working with all our municipalities and our, our sheriff's office to create these great opportunities. I understand that our police um, have some concerns definitely around salary and I'm hearing what they're making at these other places. I want to be competitive with them as well. I want to recruit the best talent for our students. I want them to, to stay with us and so we can protect our students to the best of our ability. But I believe right now that our police having those relationships with those students, having people who will actually come and speak to them, 
um, about if some issue is going on. I want the same officer to come to a school every day if that's possible. I know it's difficult with our staffing shortages, but right now when we have an officer who has a relationship with the principal who's there and working with them, to me that's special. Like That is a really good way for us to protect our students. So I, I would caution this board on moving this quickly or thinking about a um, full merger. When we have this great opportunity to work with you know, PBSO as well as all of the municipalities having that partnership. Now I understand we could possibly work on changing some of the ways that we spread out our services and I'd be happy to be talking about that, but just a full scale unloading of our police and, and taking on a new a new department, I am I'm not ready for that. I wanna see what we can do to help with the morale in our police department first and make sure that we respect what these officers have done for us over the years because they have um, they have literally saved our children from incidents happening at our schools and that cannot be looked at lightly and I'm sure they did it with partnership with PBSO I'm glad to have that partnership happening but I, I'm not looking down on school district police because I think what we have is very special and I think the officers that come to work in schools are the kind of people that we honestly want working with our students because they care about children. So I'm, I'm very glad that we still have this going on right now. I know we've gone through some leadership struggles um, in the last you know couple of years, but I think we can get that figured out and I really wanna start talking about what can we do for these officers that work for us to make that day, make this job um, the job that they imagined that it would be, um, because I think we can do that. I think it's just about us working on our leadership here. Thank you. Mrs. McQuinn. Thank you. First, I applaud our superintendent for reaching out to Sheriff Bradshaw. And Sheriff Bradshaw, I think it was the next day, he had one of, uh, what, what do we call the therapy dogs at one of our terrible incidents that in a district this large we have on far too frequent a basis. And I appreciate that because we are in, in the final analysis, we're one community. It's no secret that my experience as school-based administration has been very strong with our school police. But also, when I was an area superintendent um, in charge of the Glade schools, I had a great relationship with the officers with the sheriff's department. So you can still have those personal relationships. I mean, they knew what I was doing and I knew what they were doing. So it, it's not a who's better than. I think, you know, let's, let's just really look at cooperating with each other like Sheriff Bradshaw told um, Mr. Burke. I'm not interested in taking over your school police. I'm interested in working with you. And I can't remember if Mr. Burke pointed out that part of the cost of this contract has to do not just with salaries, but also with the equipment, the cars, the, did you do that? I just didn't pay attention. Okay. So um, I was probably thinking about what I wanted to say. So I don't see it as a, it has to be one way or the other. I do think soon that we should be looking at um, our, how our um, police department is organized. I don't think that um, Chief McCutcheon has had a lot of time to make that happen. He's had to hit the ground running in order to ensure safety and work on the morale in his department. So I want us to remember that we don't supervise school police. Our superintendent supervises school police. If we need something from the superintendent, let's let him know. I'd love to look at the money. He already knows how I feel about that, and I count on him to do that. Um, one, uh, I have one last thing to say about school police. What was part? Okay, so it shouldn't be all or nothing, and we're better if we work together, and I'm going to remember that other piece. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. McQuinn. Ms. Brill? Thank you. So just real briefly, this isn't a discussion of a merger. We know that. Um, but I want to clear up some misinformation. Um, Mrs. Whitfield, you were here, I believe, when we had the full discussion. Had we merged with the sheriff's office, it wouldn't be a different officer in the school every day. It was going to be the same officers, and all that was going to change was going to be the color of their uniforms. So um, it really is not that, it's not the drastic change. Now, I did see the sheriff on Sunday night. And 
Um, he does not have interest right now in a merger because it's a couple times ago when I brought it up, um, they did work out what the savings would be to us. And there was a savings that we could get more protection for less money, but we would have to build certain things. I know there were concerns into the contract. Um, at this juncture, he wants to work with us. He wants to help us. Um, in our security meeting, we will hear about other areas that might potentially be together. But um, I will just end by saying that down the road, I truly believe that the merger would be our best option. I said that before so that we can focus on our core, core mission. But I just wanted to clarify for everybody that have we, if we ever do go down that path, it doesn't mean that our officers go away. It just means that their uniforms change color. Thank you. Ms. McQuinn, you thought of the other thing before I call on Dr. Robinson. Well, I did, and it had to do with what Mr. Burke said about non-sanctioned. This all began, this current controversy, over an anonymous letter. You certainly pay attention when something anonymous comes your way, but we don't take it as fact. Thank you. Dr. Robinson. Okay, so this is not a conversation about the merger, but it is a conversation about the merger, huh? So I'm just gonna put it out there. Um, and say my piece. So the first contract can say anything, <laughs> and then they got you, right? So, um, oh, see? My phone th throws itself at me when I tell the truth. Okay, and then, um, but we do have to make sure our school police have the equipment that they need. There's some long standing issues that first this was gonna fix it, that we just need to address it, right? But I just, but what I don't like is a conversation that sounds like all law enforcement is the same, right? Now, there have been some times that I thought um, that we should have called the sheriff in earlier, okay? I'm gonna say it that way. Um, and I'm thankful that the sheriff responded when we did call. But I still see our school police officers as a specialty unit. So if I can compare it a bit to my um, primary occupation. So your primary care physician um, works with you to maintain your health. But if there's an emergency, they call on the emergency room physician, right? Now that emergency room physician might not be as conversant with, you know, all the health maintenance disease prevention measures that your primary is so they work in sync and that's what we i think we need to work out our school police officers in my opinion um and i'm thankful to have seen the development of them as as members of the school community that are no, known to be caring and help to prevent problems right um, now, since we have this recommendation before us, I just need to talk a little bit about what kind of training um, we're going to put in place that if I carry on with this comparison would prepare the emergency room physician who has an MD just like the primary care, okay, train that, prepare that emergency room physician to do the primary care work. So in this case, we're taking PBSO officers who are working in a more high intensity environment, um, and how do we make them uh, become part of the school police culture, right? So my request is that assuming this recommendation moves forward, that for all law enforcement that are not part of our school police, whether they're Sheriff West Palm or any of the other agencies you named, that we have them go through lifetime of consequences training, which I hope that we need to actually bring back for our school police since we have so many new ones. And for those of you who don't know, this was a training that was put together by Dr. Angela Bess and Judge Alvarez some years ago to get law enforcement and school administration to understand that when you 
criminalize a young person when it's not required by law, I'm going to say it that way, uh, that there is a lifetime of consequences. It's not just teaching them a lesson, right? There's things that will hang on to them for the rest of their lives and negatively impact their lives. And so you may be doing much more harm than you thought you were doing. And I thought that that training was very impactful. So if we're going to be taking officers that are used to dealing with, you know, high intensity situations, right? Um, so, I mean, I don't know. I, I, let me just throw, I need to throw this in. So you may have heard about a murder in a park nine days ago. That was across the street from my house. Now, those officers that responded to that shooting, that intensity, that situation, I don't want them responding to a schoolyard fight. I don't want that reaction in the schools, right? All right? And so if, if you listen to me carefully, I'm not discounting anybody's qualification. The emergency room physician has an MD just like I do, right? And so, but the, the point is to prepare people to react to a different situation. And so I would ask that we look at lifetime of consequences training, fair and impartial policing, as well as some specific training about de-escalation practices with young people. I'm not trained in that area. It's my um, observation that you de-escalate young people differently than adults. And so I would ask that we, we have an a onboarding process, so to speak, for these officers, wherever they come from, Sheriff, West Palm, any place, right, um, in order to better um, fit in our school communities. Thank you. Mrs. Andrews. Thank you. And Mr. Berg, uh, I, as I said, I just came back from the Council of Great City Schools. One of the things they talked about, this, this is the 77th largest urban school districts across America. A piece of what they're putting in place now is uh, a process where school districts can get information on how to work with chiefs of police, sheriff's offices, and so on. It's just beginning to come in place. If you can give them a call, because I think we're going to have to have those conversations of how it works as we transition. I think I love school police, but right now I'm talking about safety. I'm happy we're going to get the additional offices. I'm happy we're, we're uh, working with West Palm Beach and all these other municipalities, but I really want to know what's going to be the solution for the future, and I really will be very upset if we don't start having some real serious conversations about how we are keeping our children safe and if we're doing everything that we can to do it with all the pieces of the puzzle. And certainly uh, the morale is a big thing. And if people are frightened to speak to the board members or to others, something's wrong here. I go to a lot of schools. So we've got to figure out how we can continue working with the sheriff. He seems to like you, Mr. Burke. He said your meeting was great. So we just got to move on, but we've got to figure out where we're going. I want a few months from now for us to be able to talk about is this what we want or should we be somewhere else? And if it means a merger or whatever, we've got to be there. But I really want to know tomorrow, once we, we pass this tonight, and hopefully it's passed, that we're going to have every school covered and we're safe, and then to figure out the next steps of where we go. Yes. Uh, I'm always happy to look at whatever the Council of Great City Schools puts out. They, they do a quality, quality work. Uh, and then just again, I do feel like I have a good relationship with the sheriff. Um, I reached out to the sheriff's office for this addition, these additional 20 officers. This was, this was our doing. Uh, it would have been nice if the price was a little lower, but I didn't get everything I asked for, right? So even the, our great relationship has limits. Uh, <laughs> but, you know, we do have a good relationship with the sheriff. Uh, you know, I have a cell phone number. I have reached out to him. We had a student go missing in Georgia. He put through his resources behind uh, the search and uh, could not have been more responsive within minutes. And uh, it's very nice to know we have that 24-7 access where the sheriff's office is willing to come to our support. And uh, anyway, but yes, I will see what we've, you know, coming out of the pandemic, I think a lot of school districts have reevaluated their school police. Uh, many districts don't have their own. Uh, some, some districts started backing away from having officers in their schools altogether. Uh, 
you know, in the wake of the George Floyd murder. Uh, so things have played out over the last couple of years, so we, we always need to stay current with best practices. But, you know, having our own police force, force has been very beneficial, uh, as, as we've heard here tonight, and we continue to support them. All right. We'll take oh, a and one more thing I just have to say. <laughs> we have every school covered. This contract is to give us a little more depth on the bench. We would like to have more officers and have additional officers at, you know, schools that are larger. But we have not, you know, we continue to have an officer in schools every day. All right. All those in favor of the motion? Opposed? Motion carries 7-0. That'll take us to non-agenda speakers. I'll call you three at a time. Brother Carl Muhammad, Ezekiel Edmonds, and Patrick Glover. Please state your name for the record and watch the clock. Carl Muhammad, and I want to say um, happy birthday to my birthday ladies, and I would like to say to the women of the world, um, all of us as human beings, we need examples. I know many of us might not believe in the uh, idea of Jesus Christ, but I believe if we look at Mary, the mother of Jesus, we might have a good example because it is her, told to us that she provided us with a savior. Um, as we move forward, many times inside of our community, and I really understand what Dr. Robinson is talking about because we have a different relationship with policing in our community because of the crisis that's been going on all across the country where all of the murder and all of the other kind of stuff is taking place. So it needs to be a real conversation and it needs to be really considered. And the Sheriff's Department have a bad reputation inside of our community for uh, aggressiveness. So I just wanted to leave that on your thing. But I wish that you could do something for our community. We've been trying to reach out to you, Mr. Burt. Um, Mr. Uh, I'm glad to see Mr. Brill as the um, vice chair now and you, Mr. Uh, Barrera. We just need some conversation as it relates to how our children are doing inside of your system as a result of the pandemic. Before the pandemic, we know our children was always on the bottom of your statistics all across the state. Remember once upon a time, we was graduating only 23% out of 100. And I'm looking at all of these deficiencies that we have, and we're deserving of a conversation specifically designed for our problem. I'm one of the children of the slaves of America, and everybody in this room know that we have different reality than anybody in this room because we're the only people that was brought here against our will and made, uh, designed what we are. And when we look at the education that we've been rendered, we can see how it's disturbing to us because right now, even in the largest municipality here in, the, in West Palm, in Palm Beach County, um, we have a, a so-called uh, colored um, mayor, and he has the authority. I mean, this guy dismantled the African-American Advisory Council. So we have a lot of injury in our community, and we know that we don't have too many friends, but we send me, they send me out here to try to be a reminder to try to share some good information with y'all because we're not your enemy. We're the best friend that you have when it comes to dealing with our children because we want the best for our community, but we see that the school district is not providing that kind of thing. And lastly, I've been on the Achievement Matters for All, the Superintendent Task Force, the African American Task Force, all of those task forces. And when the crisis come up, we get excited, but then we put it right back on the shelf. And I've been dealing with some of your uh, assistant superintendents and the professionalism that we're receiving. Mr. Burt and Ms. Brill, we need a conversation, and I'm hoping to reach back out to you so that we can have it in private and we don't have to have it out here in the public. Thank you so very much, and happy uh, birthday, y'all. Thank you. Mr. Edmonds or Ms. Glover? Karen Moran, Danielle Underwood. Go ahead, ma'am. Hi. Um, I I'm Karen Moran with Save Our Schools of America. Um, good evening, board members. Uh, first, I'd like to say that I'm in no way a hater of any group of people. My concern here today is for the children and for the parents of those children. It seems like there is a total disregard for the definition of male and female. A woman is an adult female person. Scientifically, a female person is an individual of the sex which conceives and bears forth young, or in a wider sense, has an ovary and produces ova. Sex, the differentiation between male and female determined by whether an X-bearing sperm or a Y-bearing sperm fertilizes the X-bearing ovum, which determines the type of sexual and reproductive organs that develop 
and the biological differences between females and males. All people are either male or female by DNA. What a person feels like or identifies as has nothing to do with it. We all have compassion for those that have gender confusion. Those that are in this category are being told that they can transition. The truth is there is no such thing as transitioning from one sex to another. There's only a pumping a body full of hormones and mutilating the body through surgeries. No one knows the long-term effects of hormones and the damage it may cause, not to mention the emotional pain to parents and to the individuals themselves. In Lewis Carroll's book, Through the Looking Glass, Alice came upon Humpty Dumpty. They had a discussion that was confusing to her, and she says, I don't know what you mean. He responds, of course you don't, till I tell you. She argues with his definition of glory, and Humpty Dumpty responds by saying that a word means just what I choose it to mean. When she further argues, he proclaims a question, which is to be master? In other words, is the made-up meaning of words going to be the master or true science in biology? We cannot allow a new definition of sex to be defined to include gender identity where sex has been redefined, such as in women's sports, prisons, restrooms, lockers, and gyms, and other places, women are being made to surrender to biological males. This is the moment predators have been waiting for. While you're protecting feelings and what you believe to be the rights of the gender confused, you're putting our children in danger. Girls have been raped in bathrooms and locker rooms where biological males took advantage of the definition gender identity. Let's not go down the rabbit hole by erasing the fact that there are only two biological genders. We cannot embrace a new definition and keep our children safe from predators. Thank you very much. Danielle Underwood, Michael Lefebvre, Dr. Suzanne Page. Michael Lefebvre, I've been coming to these meetings for almost two years. I was here for four hours on February 23rd, a few hours this evening. Equity, diversity, something about me being racist and sexist, but not one word about actual academia. You know, math, science, history, reading, but not one word. You sit up here and whine about parents are too tough on you. Look what you are and are not teaching our kids. Look how you treat us parents. Look how you treat the police. It's disgraceful. Look how you have these cops treating us. We're nothing more than concerned parents, and it's disrespectful. You wonder why we're so upset out here. I have an outburst about you not properly teaching our kids, and you stick the police on me. Then you turn right around and cuss them very same police out. Some of you police did their bidding, too, and the, we the people noticed. So you put out a simple apology, and all is right with Jesus. Huh, Mr. Barbieri? How about you apologize to the parents you've been so disrespectful to? or drop charges for a father arrested while standing quietly in a corner? How about you start the healing process by actually teaching our kids something useful for once? Something that might help them succeed in life, not just hate in life. How do you even call yourselves a school board? All this is is a social experiment. You're so busy being woke and teaching hate and confusion to our kids, and none of your focus is on real, tangible success. None. I know, because I've never once heard you speak of it. Until tonight, geez. Schools for preparing kids for success in life, not being woke. And kids, being woke will not be a key, a key to your success. There's no reason to be teaching gender identity or sexual orientation in schools ever, in any grade. You should not be focused on skin pigment, and your running of these school boards is downright scary. We're getting a little tired of this. We owe you something for being here mentality you carry. You get paid plenty of taxpayer money. You should actually do your job and realize that you work for us. Schools have, have parents. 
who bring their kids to these facilities. That's us. I'll tell you what, if it wasn't for your COVID overreaction fiasco, and my daughter was still allowed to be in school here, and I found out you were teaching this filth to my seven-year-old, I'd have brought you up on charges. And I urge any parent who finds this, in this filth in their child's school to do the same. It is time for this to stop. I see your face, you're a little scared now, aren't you? Parents, kids, anytime you hear diversity, inclusion, equity, every time they put social in front of another word, trust me, they have changed the meaning of the word to fit the narrative. Think about it. These are the people that can't tell you, scientifically tell you, if you're a male or a female, or won't. In other words, they're ignorant. And Thank you, Mr. LeFevre. Dr. Susan Page, Ashley Labod. I'm Dr. Suzanne Page. Um, thank you for allowing me to speak and please take uh, my comments as a reminder because that's how they're meant. Um, I've heard on more than one occasion by more than one school board member that it is a privilege to speak to the school board. That's a little disturbing because it's a, it's a concern and it is disturbing because whether through taxes or lottery, taxpayers fund either directly or indirectly all salaries of the staff, administrators, teachers. We fund medical care, Medicare, health insurance, union dues, all the buildings and everything that's included in them down to the last paper clip or pen that you may use. It's also mind boggling that as a longtime educator, I'm hearing that with a budget in excess of $3.8 billion, teachers have to reach into their pockets to, to, to buy supplies for their classrooms. That is absolute, that's an embarrassment. And I've been an educator in the classroom with these kids and out of the classroom, I'm currently online, but since 1977 when I went to the University of Illinois as a graduate student. It's, it's disgraceful. Things need to change. And my last point, we want to come here. We want to communicate with you. We want to work with you. We want to do it respectively. Parents and taxpayers, because all of this is coming out of our pockets, we're frustrated. And some, yes, are angry. But please remember, you work for us. Thank you. My name is Ashley Labad. I am a teacher with no pencils, but there's masks in our school for the kids that need it. Newsflash, DeSantis said in um, his speech the other day that material that teachers do not feel comfortable teaching will not have to teach. Uh, human growth and development. When you guys send that out, we'll check it out. Um, Barbieri says, I do not like to turn off the mic. Please don't turn off my mic. I'm here just to speak because that's my right. I'm actually a parent on top of this board. I was looking at the budget. I saw that 9.9% um, of the money is be being spent for operation and maintenance of plants, but only 9% is instructional support. Considering my fifth graders are on a third grade comprehension reading level, I'm not sure why this is happening. I saw other stuff in the budget, so you guys were talking about that a lot tonight. Let's spend more money instead of that COVID money, that SR funds that you got, which, woo, millions and millions of dollars there. Um, that should be spent on fixing what you guys have done to our kids the past two and a half years. They're behind because of your choices. 28 sites had vaccinations. The number that I saw also from the data was 1,786 totally vaccinated. Um, this doesn't include outside sites. I want to know that you guys will um, take recognition. Hello, over here. Yeah, you guys talking? Barbieri, Burke, hey. Um, for adverse reactions, because I've already seen some things going on. Um, I also saw in one of the budgets, $76,500 was spent for new carpets. I did the math, and since I'm a teacher, I know that about $125 per carpet. That would be 612 carpets. Um, we spent millions on COVID, send it to the kids. We need that money. 62% is a A school, 
and you guys said that we have 95.9% that graduation rate. I can tell you right now, they are not prepared. We need more help. So these numbers, 62% of you're a teacher, you know that's not good. Uh, let's see. 1,600, no, sorry. 167,378 students. Um, that's what we have at our schools apparently right now. But I think we were at 193. Um, voter approval, you guys are seeking it, but you don't have it, we want you gone. And uh, you guys like music, so one of the songs that came to mind recently is by Hi Res and Jimmy Levy, Welcome to the Revolution, so I thought that I'd share that with you. We will not comply with the institution, sick illusions, no it won't be televised. Welcome to the revolution. They're trying to dumb us down. We're not going to be dumbed down. We're here to fight. Robert Rosetto, Jen Showalter. Hi, I'm Jen. Is this on? Hi, I'm Jen Schulter, and I want to talk about how we're losing around the world academically. All of your policies and decisions have created a deep dive in student academic performance. The disingenuous performance skills and bloated numbers disguise the real truth. You push a 94.9% .9 graduation rate, though others have reported it as low as 74%. Our U.S. News and World Report score has our College Ready Index as 28 out of 100 with a 53% reading proficiency and a math proficiency of 47%. As you already noted, there are teachers and o OTs that are reporting two to three grades behind schedule. That's unacceptable. We have no non-magnet high schools in the top 40 regionally, no high school in the top 10 high schools in the state of Florida. Out of 1,073 statewide, we only have four in the top 50. Nationally, out of almost 18,000 high schools, we don't have one in the top 100 and only four in the top 1,000. Lake Worth High's math proficiency is 28% and a college-ready index of 4.9, yet a 79% graduation rate. Palm Beach Central has a 58% math proficiency, 25.4 college-ready index, and a 96% graduation rate. Boynton Beach High at 22% in math, 11 uh, CRI, and 86% graduation rate. And Glades is even worse with, Glades is even worse with 24% math proficiency and a 91% graduation rate. What does this tell you? The kids are getting pushed out the door and they're not ready. The students are not prepared for facing worldwide competition, let alone anything next door or going to college. Um, uh, OTs have reported that pre-K can't even tell the difference between happy and sad faces. And there was a local speech pathologist that said there's a 364% increase in speech delays. And as a mother of two with speech delays, I can attest to the problems that your mandates have caused. As for our police, our officers are overworked, understaffed, which, which violates Florida statutes. And we support and pray for the uh, Royal Palm Beach students over the tragedy. But, you know, there have been a lot of incidents that have gone unreported, including the 10 that were sent from that school just the other week for a massive fight that, was not, that could have been prevented or, or minimized by having enough staff there. Um, there are long-standing problems which have put the lives of our students and staff in danger. And if the board truly cared, that equipment and all those issues would have been taken care of a long time ago. A long time ago. Our children need better safety and the staff, and the staff need better safety. And that comes with letting this force be absorbed by the PBSO. Thank you. Edward Niesenbaum and Alexandra Burke. Good evening. My name is Robert Rosetto, and I want to start off by saying our hearts and prayers are with the woman that was strangled and allegedly almost killed this week by Stephen Barbieri. Per Boca News Now, the son of Palm Beach County School Board President Frank Barbieri is in the Palm Beach County Jail Tuesday morning charged with domestic battery by strangulation. Boca Raton Police arrested Stephen Barbieri overnight. He was booked in the jail at 1.24 in the morning. The arrest occurred in the area of Barbieri's home, and the physical address was provided in the article, but out of respect and privacy reasons, I'll admit it here. Law enforcement source provided the following details from a report not yet filed with the clerk of courts. And in quotes, 
Upon arrival, I heard a verbal altercation coming from the apartment in which a male was aggressively yelling and cursing at another subject inside. I then knocked on the door and made a contact with Stephen Barbieri. According to Barbieri, he was inside his apartment with the victim having a verbal altercation. Barbieri stated the argument never became physical at any time. I then spoke with the victim, who appeared to be in visible distress. According to the victim, she was in, phys- she was in a physical altercation with her on-off boyfriend, Stephen Barbieri. The victim confirmed she was the female screaming for help after Barbieri attacked her while inside his apartment. The victim further advised during the physical altercation, Barbieri strangled her with both of his hands to the point where she could not breathe, put a pillow over her face to the point she could not breathe, threw her to the ground multiple times, and bit her lip. Also from police, the victim advised the altercation occurred in the bedroom where she went to talk with them. The victim stated that during the conversation, Barbieri suddenly grabbed her and threw her to the ground multiple times. Shortly after, Barbieri grabbed her by the throat and with both hands and choked her to the point where it restricted her airflow. The victim also stated that Barbieri covered her mouth with a pillow in his hands to prevent her from screaming for help. It should be noted the victim advised that if law enforcement did not arrive when he did, Barbieri would have killed her. This is all relevant because Frank Barbieri has had his own anger issues come to light, most recently towards the school police last month when he yelled, cursed, and threatened them. Obviously, the apple didn't fall far from the tree, and it's clear that someone who can't control his own anger and didn't do a better job raising one of his own children should absolutely not be in charge of our children. With all due respect, Chairman Barbieri, it's time you step down. Moving on and changing subjects a little here in the last 30 so seconds. The men playing women's sports getting trophies for winning? Like, great, let's celebrate a man for beating some women. Oh, maybe we do here, I don't know. But woman of the year is a biological male. Best woman swimmer is a biological male. This week, Supreme Court nominee Judge Jackson could not provide the definition of a woman during her Senate Judiciary confirmation hearing. He, she, his, him, hers, them, they. Screw a pronoun because everyone's a moron these days. Pronouns are important. We learn them, too, in school. But it's insane that today we're having debates on the number of genders. Here's something you might not want to hear, but there's two. Male and Thank you, Mr. Thank you, Mr. Edward Niesenbaum, Alexander Burke. Mr. Barbieri, I appreciate if you not talk during somebody's speeches. This is disrespect again. My name is Edward, and I'm a fifth grader. Mr. Barbieri, you became extremely famous recently. Five of my friends contacted me and showed me the article about you and told the story about your behavior after last board meeting. When I went to school next morning, almost everybody knew how you cursed the police officers and how many times you used the F word. Kindergartens and first graders learned who you are and learned the F word at the same time. I think this is your biggest achievement. You improved kids' vocabulary. I told my friends stories about how you were kicking out people from meetings for much less vulgar words. I asked my principal how the students would be punished in case he or she behaved like you. She stated the punishment would be very serious, but she never witnessed so vulgar behavior from any student. My older friend would, uh, my older friend, from Sunday school told me that some of the students were supporting you and even showing middle fingers to police officers, but inside their pockets because they were afraid of punishment. So students from high school were thinking that you wanted to defund the police and convert Boca Raton to a sanctuary city. My class had a vote. The result is 23 to two. You have to resign. Mr. Barbary, you can't work in education system anymore. You are like Putin. You think that you're a local king and you can do anything you anything without punishment. You use the F word during conversations with my mom. With my mom. You curse police officers and then sent an email with sorry. You're not a kid. You should be accountable for your actions. Your vulgar behavior is damaging kids' future. I can only imagine how vulgar you are at home and how you yell at your kids. I don't want any kid from Palm Beach County to end up in jail because of your unprofessional vulgar fake leadership. You failed as educator. Do the right thing 
at least once for a change, resign. You did a lot of damage already, and it is too late for you to learn what the word respect means. Thank you. Alexander Burke. Uh, during last meeting, I have a small talk with the head of diversity and equity committee. She'd been here before. I really like her honesty. I told her that Jewish people are now the part of marginalized group, and she has to share her budget with us. She stated that she can only help with Holocaust. After I stated that no help with Holocaust needed, Hitler already did his job. She stated that the money for her people, for her sisters and brothers. The question popped up in my mind. Who is your people, Mrs. Brill? And do you know who Jewish people are, Mrs. Brill? Who are your sisters and brothers? Jews can be white, Asian, or black. What is keeping us all together is our religion. Last board meeting, I asked you ask for additional time for Holocaust presentation. Why? We have enough presentation, Mrs. Brill. All it's your plan to get more donation for Jewish organization. Organization. Uh, who is your people, Mrs. Brill? Where are you? When you actually supporting the curriculum that is not using God when introducing Jewish holidays. Look at this, Mrs. Brill. Non-Jewish kids think that Hanukkah is about silly Jews playing stupid game for eight days. This is your curriculum, Mrs. Brill. Where, are, where were you, Mrs. Brill, when you signed the letter then condemned the law that prohibited teachers and staff from teacher topics such like as sexual orientation and gender identity to students in kindergartens and so third grade. Do you know how important the same family for Jews? Do you know how uncomfortable kids are around aggressive LGBT, LGBTQ activists? What is the reason to eliminate religious from school? Lip says, uncomfortable for unbelievers. Our kids, Mrs. Brill, are very uncomfortable when school is getting converted to alternative sex education. Liberal activists stated multiple times in this room, if you don't like our propaganda, homeschool or pay for private school. Did you voice your opposition? To the Thank you, Mrs. Burke. Superintendent, do you have anything else? No, sir. You need a motion to adjourn. Motion by Mrs. Andrews, second by Dr. Robinson. Any discussion? All in favor? Opposed? Motion carries 7 0. Meeting is adjourned. Meeting. Tutoring, Cote Professor Cayadeo, Epinogan.